Okay, happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. All right. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yeah, and hey, I just want to encourage you guys. If you're watching online today, happy Easter. And again, type in uh, to the number 951-382-5111. He is risen indeed. Right, so just uh, just celebrate with us on this fine Easter day. You know, we've been getting to know some of the staff uh, around here, playing games with them and getting to know them. And so I thought Easter Sunday would be a great opportunity to get to know some of the Harris kids, Greg and Teresa's kids. So introduce yourselves real quick. Uh, hi, I'm Nate. I'm Adeline. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Andrew. And I have known you guys basically as long as your parents have known. So, so this should be very comfortable and, and comforting for you. So we are going to play this and that. So you have to pick an answer. You can't be on the fence, you have to pick something. So, so here you go guys. Who is easier, mom or dad? In what way? Just easier, whatever way you want it. Yeah. It depends on the situation. No wavering. You're on restriction. Dad, no, no, time out. You're on time out. Go ahead. Mom or dad, who's easier? Mom. Mom? Uh, yeah, mom. It depends on the situation. Okay, you obviously are not a rule follower. All right, so out of the four of you, who keeps your room the cleanest? Wait, what? Who keeps your room the cleanest? Oh, me. Oh, yeah, okay. Who is in trouble most often? Me. Oh. <laughs> all of us? Okay, all of you are like saying somebody <laughs> else. Who is in the most in trouble most often? Me. Jonathan. Yeah? All right. All right. Out of the four of you, who is your parents' favorite? Me. I can't answer that. I'm not going to answer You're not going to or you can't? I'm not going to. Oh. I don't even know. I'm you know, you can, you, can, you can answer that. They're not going to hear that. I'm your favorite the daughter. Girl. You're the favorite daughter. Okay, that's easy. Who is your favorite? Me or your dad? My dad. My dad. My dad. My dad. <laughs> okay, I just want to point this out. I have never, like, yelled at you guys. I have never, like, punished you guys or disciplined you guys. And you know what? When, when we used to do Bible study at your house and you cried all the time, I never went in there, told you to hush up. I've always been the nice guy. <laughs> Let's answer that again. Who do you like better, me or your dad? Definitely my, my dad. dad. Definitely okay. my dad. All right, you know what? We'll move on. Okay, you guys are the pastor's kids, right? So I've got a theological question for you. What do you, what do you believe is, is more true? Supralapsarianism or infralapsarianism? Which one do you think? Are we allowed to true? Google? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't please. even understand what you even said. All right. All right. So again, macaroni and cheese, is it a side dish or is it a entree? Side dish. Side dish. Side no dish. Side dish. Side dish. Okay, you've heard it from the pastor. You've heard it from the pastor's kids, Nancy. Macaroni and cheese is never an entree. All right? Hey, happy Easter to all you guys. God bless. He is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. All right. Thank you, guys. Church family, we're so glad you could join us for Easter this year online. And as we go into these next few songs, let's just remember to think about why we're celebrating Easter, just the amazing thing that God did for us on the cross. And not only that, but that he rose from the grave in order to save us and make a way for us to go to heaven with, with him. And this past year has brought a lot of ups and downs and a lot of challenges for us. And so we can rest assured knowing that he brings beauty from ashes. He can make the dead rise, he can make the blind see, he can make the lame walk again, and he can overcome whatever you're going through. So as we think about the lyrics of the next song and as we sing them out, just remember that God can make things beautiful for you. He can redeem you, he can take away all your sins, he can make your past failures just be forgotten. So as we sing to him on this Easter, Let's just remember just the beauty of the cross and what he did for us. Let's sing this out.
Happy Easter, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us if you're watching us online or wherever you're at. You know, it's been a heck of a year, hasn't it? There's been all kinds of things going on, rivalries, frustrations, and it's really hard sometimes when you're in that situation, when we get to a holiday, not to try and manufacture a feeling because you're just like, oh, it's been a long holiday or trying really hard to make it a happy day. But I do think there is plenty to celebrate when it comes to about the resurrection and the celebrating our Lord. Um, and it's really stories that in the most difficult of times that inspire us. And uh, I want to tell you one of those stories. You see, see recently we have, uh, we did a James Project and you probably heard some of that, about that. But we have James Project, we also have Care Portal, we have Benevolence Funds. All these just become titles when you're actually working in a church and you probably hear those phrases a lot. But I want to just kind of move those aside and tell you how those ministries actually just help one-on-one -on -one people care for one another. You see, all, all this time's going on. COVID's been a, a difficult time for many people. Um, there was someone we helped that I think it really set the pace for what's been going on. Um, there's a lady at our church by the name of Debbie Redinger. Now, Debbie works here on staff at the, at the school, and uh, she's a loving person. She cares for people, and she just happens to be uh, uh, connected with her neighbors, and she was helping a neighbor that she felt was in need. He's a name by, the neighbor's name was Horace Jackson. And Horace had just lost his wife, and he, he is uh, in a chair. If you see him, um, say hi. He's just really struggling with difficult things that are going on in his life. And so she thought maybe, hey, you know what, maybe we, our church can help. And so I, I just gave her, uh, Melinda, who runs our James Project's phone number, we sat down with Horace, and wow, what a story. 
So here sometimes we think that we're going to go in and we're going to help someone and we're going to do all this stuff, but it's really amazing how many times we realize when we're helping someone else that they're blessing us in return. You see, what's interesting about Horace is that he served his country during Vietnam. He was in the army, he was a special forces officer, and he had spent many a years in some of the most difficult conflict, and he had sacrificed for his country. And it's just amazing to see that the, the people at, at a time when things were rough and difficult, that this man decided to put his life on the line to care for other people. And man, that just doesn't really, if, if nothing registers about what the love of the Lord is like, it's, it's people sacrificing of themselves to care for other people. And so we thought we would come out and help this guy, but this guy's been helping us enjoy our freedoms as Christians, as other people in our nations. For, for, for his sacrifice for us. So it's, it's not even hard to love someone like that and care for someone like that. What I didn't know, though, is through the course of everybody helping us, that we learn to grow through his sacrifice by emulating that one. And what I didn't know is that he would come and join us, and he's actually come here and been a part of our fellowship. And see, that's the thing. I'm wondering how many great stories and personalities of people that we just don't know because we're so fixated on all the negative stuff going on. And what I find is when we focus on the Lord and we step out like Debbie did, like Melinda and all the James Project, just to love somebody, it's amazing what God can do when we think about others. And it's amazing that the things that we can recognize about others and pull them into our community. You know, it's been a blessing to consider Horace a, a friend of the church and a church a friend of his. It has been great to pull his neighborhood together, to share about what's going on at a time when people are having a hard time getting along. And so that's what it reminds me of when I look at the verse that Jesus says. Uh, uh, it, he says, do, not, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, as we see all the time, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of us not look to our own interests, but to the interests of others having this mind amongst yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus. You see, when we just act that simple act of obedience, I mean, there's no telling how many stories God can open up in the lives of other people. There's no telling who we can touch and who we can minister to, and then we get ministered to in doing that. I think nothing makes our God happier than when we do that, and nothing reflects the sacrifice enough when we sacrifice of ourselves to do that when people aren't really willing to do that. And so I'm just wondering how many horses that I have the privilege of meeting in the future with all the things that God wants to do when we all jump out as a church to love those people God's placed around us. So I just want to pray for that as we pray for the offering and as we celebrate this day, the day that our Lord sacrificed the most for us, that it is a privilege and an honor to love other people because we get to please Him for all that He's done for us. So let's pray for that as we pray for the offering and as we pray for this future. Uh, Lord God, I just thank you so much for those who are sacrificing the, of the first fruits of all the things that they've gone and worked for, and they worked hard, Lord, but that they want to bless you, and they want to bless their community and love others, God. Whether that's their time, their resources, or their talents, Lord, I just pray that we as a church come together and use that wisely and lovingly, but we do that from, from the heart and just caring for one another, even if it's just spending more time to care for our neighbors, Lord. We thank you so much for the stories that you're going to bring in the years to come, that we can celebrate at Christmas and then Easter again and all that you've done, because everything is because of what you did for us on the cross, and we're so thankful, Lord. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Easter, right? He is risen. Well, happy Easter. He is risen. 
That's right. He is risen indeed. We're excited to begin a series here on Easter. So we're talking about uh, the idea of Jesus as our victor over victimhood. We're talking about moving out of victimhood. And to be honest, this is a big deal. You're like, this isn't a normal Easter message. What, what is this? Well, the reason we're getting into this is because man, we have to talk about the issues of victory and victimhood and these things because they're huge in our culture. And to be quite honest, I deal with it a lot. I mean, I've got four little kids, if you don't, if you don't know that, um, or I had four little kids, but I have four big kids now, teenagers and one 10 year old. And the bottom line is, man, there's a lot of stuff that kids feel like, hey, they don't deserve that they get in life. And we have to help them through that. I can remember countless times my little kids would come in after they just had an awesome day, enjoying everything. And they're like offered a dinner that they don't necessarily like. Maybe there was cheese on the dinner or maybe there was something like oh i don't know like a, a strange looking meat sauce that they'd never seen before and they would look at me like this is horrible i don't want to eat this this is awful my day is horrible now but I, and i'd say hey i got a word for that and they'd look at me and go what and i'd say Wee! and that was my thing i would always look at them and say anytime they complain anytime they acted like oh what was me i was like i got a word for that now they just roll their eyes and they walk away and go, yeah well, and they get it. They realize they're complaining. And it's awesome when they do it back to me. And they look at me and they go, Dad, I got a word for that. I'm like, shut up. You know, that's just how it works. Back and forth, we find ourselves constantly acting like victims, acting like we, we don't deserve what we got, stuff like that. Now, this series is about one thing, though. It's about moving, not, not just out of being a victim, but being in the victimhood. This idea that we can get ourselves stuck in a victim mentality, in a way of seeing everything in our lives as against us and, and, and fighting us. And I get it. All of us immediately like, pause. Well, let's go watch something else right now because I'm not a victim. I don't need this. Well, hold on a minute. Because I think that's a noble objection, but everybody I know, everyone has been victimized at some point. You've been a victim at some point in your life. And all a victim is, is someone who has received harm, harassment, or issues, who had been put in a situation they didn't deserve, and they received harm from it. A simple example for me, the time I probably really was victimized, was the first day I moved into my current house. We had just moved our stuff over. I parked in the front yard and, or not in the yard, but in, the fr in front of my front yard and opened the hood, trunk up and the next morning it was wide open and the paintball gun I had put in there was gone. Welcome to the neighborhood. You've been robbed, right? That's being victimized. That is a, I've been found myself as a victim. Maybe you didn't get the promotion that you'd worked so hard for and it was promised it was given to somebody else because of age or something else. You were victimized. Maybe you've had parents that were divorced and you know what? Your life kind of spun out of a different control. You, you never realized how much it affected you. You've been victimized. Look, that's a big deal, but there's a bit of us, some of us are going to recoil from this idea because to be quite honest, our culture loves victimization right now. Our culture is a, they're calling it a victim culture. And the victim culture brings a lot of problems. First and foremost, when we're victims, when we really have encountered victimization, a community will surround the victim. They will support the victim. They'll care for the victim and they'll shun the victimizer. In other words, what happens is you gain a moral strength you gain a community, you gain a lot of love and concern, and the person who harmed you is rightly put away and shoved away and, and set aside. And what we see then is an entire culture that's now doing that over the smallest offenses, over all kinds of things. We, we shout our victimization, we show off how we've been offended and harmed, and everybody rushes to support the victim because we don't dare ever tell the victim they're wrong. We don't dare ever put the victim down. And here's the problem. We don't know when a real victim is a victimization has occurred or a fake one. There's a lot of fake victims out there now. There's a lot of people who have used this and have falsely made themselves victims. We'll go over some of those in the series. But then there's those who have just easily offended and easily feel like everything they go through is about some status of, as a victim. And that's the case. They've moved into what I call the victimhood. Now, what's wrong then is true victims, people who have been harmed through some kind of abuse or some kind of issue between um, maybe it was a rape or some horrible thing in which they found themselves uh, lot losing jobs or because of racism or something like that. True victims in a true reality don't get help because what happens is we turn all of this into an enablement. We turn it all into this 
superpower that you can have as a victim because people will be behind you. They'll never tell you you're wrong. And our culture is having a hard time helping victims move on and to enjoying their life and to engaging. And when this case, and the reason this happens in either case, whether it be you're a fake victim or a real victim, and nobody thinks they're a fake victim unless they're making it up, but in either case, what happens is that we situate ourselves into the victimhood. What's the victimhood? It's a victim mentality. It's a mentality where you live as a victim. It becomes your identity. And it's right there that all of us are like, well, that ain't me. I'm good. I'm not a victim. Well, time out. All of us at some point live in victimhood. All of us at some point are going to find ourselves, whether from a small victimization or a large one, are going, or even a fake one, are going to start seeing certain things like, hey, man, that was wrong. I'm a victim, whatever. And if, here's some just hints. Maybe you found yourself doing some of these, but they're good indications that you may be living in the victimhood. Let's start with the first one. You use absolute thinking. What do you mean absolute thinking, Greg? Well, absolute thinking is a scenario where you're getting into a situation with your spouse or you're talking to your teenager and they say something like, and you ask them, well, who's, who's doing this to you? Everybody's doing this to me or nobody cares about me. Absolute thinking. Or maybe they, you hear something like, well, what, 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 what is this? That, well, everybody is, everything is this way. Or no, nothing is this way. Nothing's fair anymore. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's systematic. You know, this kind of situation. That's absolute thinking. And it's the terms and the, well, what is going on? You can't identify the thing. So it's everything is the problem. Everybody's the problem. You know, here's my problem. It's always this way. It's never this way. You know what? It's everywhere. It's, it's just everything. It's you're just driving yourself crazy in absolute thinking. And we would never do that, would we? Obviously, in the middle of a fight, obviously in the middle of your life, we've all used absolute thinking. And it's great to catch ourselves because often when we're that way, we're falling into the victimhood and we're moving in. And so maybe it's not, maybe, maybe this is one of those things that you see, or maybe what you're seeing is you keep coming back to a particular issue where you've been victimized. You can't let it go. In fact, you begin to color everything as that issue. You know what I'm talking about when that friend calls you up and you're kind of like, okay, we're going to talk about that again, aren't we? Because they love to address and bring up to you that situation that happened to them or that person who keeps doing this thing to them. And and even though you've given them routes and you've given them help, they just want to keep bringing it back up. Or maybe your mind keeps ruminating and rehearsing the wrong that's been done to you and the things that have happened to you. And you just can't let it go because your mind won't let it go. In fact, maybe you're you're just hoping that that person, something wrong has happened to them. You keep them in a jail cell locked up tight in your mind, waiting for vengeance, waiting for that day when they're going to get their comeuppance. And you keep talking about it. You keep bringing it up. Even when you thought you were done with it, it keeps showing up. Maybe in your dreams, in conversations, or when somebody else does something slightly like it that reminds you. Hey, we can keep coming back to the issue because we're living in the victimhood. Or maybe you're telling yourself one other thing. You know, it's not my fault. It's not my, you're telling yourself, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your, it's not my fault. You know, it's, it's nobody, it's, it's, it's their fault. And and if you're telling yourself it's not your fault, you're in a dangerous position because you're releasing your responsibility, you're becoming helpless. You're saying like, I can't change anything. I didn't do this to me. This is, this is everything else out there. The absolute thinking along with all these things turns into, I have my own problems. It wasn't my fault. This isn't my issue. I can't do anything about it. This is the kind of thinking that will lead us quickly to move into the, in, to the victimhood. And, and as we're there living in this place, man, we're gonna see some problems. And I want to urge you in this series to identify where you're living because there's a lot more. And next week we're going to get into the details to really identify whether you're living in the victimhood and when you're doing so because we got to get out of it as soon as possible. We got to move out, pack those boxes, get up, get moving into a new neighborhood to move into victory. Because here's the problem with victim mentality. Here's the problem with the victimhood. And that is this, that basically when we're living there, We are so self-focused, so self-consumed by our own issues and problems, we can't love. And if love is the number one thing God has called us to, then we've got an issue. Because love is to be unfair to yourself for the good of another person. 
And if it's all about you and your harms, you're not going to be unfair to you for anybody else because you need help and you're the victim. You're the one people need to be unfair to. This is how this works and love stops. And so victimhood, it destroys relationships, it destroys marriages, it destroys jobs, and it destroys opportunities and friendships, and you need to get out of that place as quickly as you can. So how? How do we move out of the victimhood? How do we move past that? Well, that's why we're talking about it on Easter. Happy Easter. The answer is found in Easter. The, the answer is found in the Bible, in this beautiful book that gives us an answer that we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus today. And we're going to see how all that ties together. Because my bottom line here is in order for you to move out of the victimhood, you have to follow the victor. You have to follow the victor. And who's the victor but Jesus? Now, we'll see this because here's what I'm saying. In the Bible, there's actually only a couple of words, and they're only found in the Old Testament, that are translated into the word victim. Now, the idea is all throughout the Bible, but the word victim shows up in a couple times in the Old Testament. The first time it shows up, it's a word that is translated victim, but more times it's used as crushed or oppressed. And the idea here is somebody who has been pushed down upon, who's been dealt with in such a way that they are, they are held down and they can't release themselves by a power greater than them or by a situation greater than them, and so they are crushed under it. They don't have the power against it. The second way that they will use this word um, is pierced. Victim is pierced. And what it means is wounded. That there's somebody who's been harmed, pierced in a sense. Oh, and now you're doomed. It's pierced by a sword, pierced by some kind of famine or plague or something so that you are the victim of that thing that's harming you. And so what we see here is these two words, crushed, oppressed, pierced, are, are all victim aspects. Now, what I find interesting about, about this is that there is an actual prophecy made in the book of Isaiah. It's a 2,500-year-old prophecy that we actually have documents older than the first century that has this actual prophecy in it. And here's what it says. It talks about one who is coming, a Messiah, this, this anointed one, who is supposed to be for Israel to, to set them free. And it says this, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him as stricken, smitten by God. So here's this one who's carrying our problems, our griefs, our sorrows, and he's smitten by God, and he's afflicted. And then it says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. That means he was wounded for our sins, and he was crushed for our iniquities. There are two words. And upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds, and by his wounds, we are healed. Check this out. He is pierced, and this one is crushed, oppressed, and that's for our sins and for our iniquities. Right here, we see that whoever this Messiah is, whoever this one who is coming is, is going to be a victim. They're going to be a victim in both terms, oppressed and pierced. And here's the thing. This came about in Jesus Christ in 33 AD. Over 500 years after this was penned and put down, Hundreds of years after the early, or hundred years after the earliest document we have with this in it, Jesus shows up on the scene, and indeed, what happens is he is crucified. He is crushed, bruised, and beaten, oppressed by his leadership, and he is pierced literally upon a cross to bear our sins. And what happens is suddenly this historic event in which Jesus was crucified and he was victimized becomes a linchpin for all of history and for everyone who has been a victim. What I want you and I to see is that, man, we have an opportunity to see that God understands our situation because Jesus did nothing wrong. He was a victim. In fact, everybody around him said he did nothing wrong. Pilate, his judge, said he did nothing wrong. They said they were shouting, all the, all the leadership was shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And a third time, this is the third time Pilate says this, he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found no guilt deserving death in him. I will therefore punish and release him. And so Pilate said, hey, he's done no evil. He hasn't done anything wrong. He's not guilty. Okay, so the criminal next to him, this guy who knows something's wrong, has watched Jesus, done this thing, has already hurled insults at Jesus. The other guy's doing it. And he tells him, hey, we indeed are, we're justly receiving what we're getting. 
We are receiving the due reward for our deeds. We're getting the crucifixion, but this man has done nothing wrong. It's recorded further that the actual man who crucifies him, the soldier standing next to him, the centurion who's got the duty to kill Jesus, he sees all the situation and he declares that Jesus did, yep, you got it, nothing wrong. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, certainly this man was innocent. And so Jesus is clearly a victim. He did nothing wrong, and yet he was crucified. In fact, I want to take it one step even further. Not only Jesus was a victim, he was the greatest victim that has ever, ha- uh, that has ever suffered. You see, really? That, that's, that's a big deal. No, I want you to think about it for a minute because uh, Jesus is a victim who is never a victimizer. All of us, at some point in our lives, have both been the victim and the victimizer. We've harmed someone at some point. We've harmed somebody in some way at some point in our lives. Whether we wanted to or not, we have victimized people. But Jesus never did. Jesus never, never broke and victimized a person. And yet he was victimized. We get this in one spot. It's all over the Bible, but... Jesus is the greatest victim is clearly seen here in 1 Peter chapter 2. If you've got your Bible, I want you to open it up there. 1 Peter is in the far end of your Bible. If you want to turn there, you can find it. You'll find chapter 2. We're looking at verses 21 through 25. You're going to want to stay there because we're going to reference it a few times. But the bottom line is that what Peter is talking about in this section is he's writing the churches about suffering as victims. He's saying the whole, chap, the whole book is an encouragement to the church to, to do good though you're suffering, to be good though you're suffering, though you go through suffering, do so because you don't deserve it like the criminal, but because you've been doing good and you don't deserve it. In other words, as you're a victim, hey, know something, we have one who is truly the greatest victim that we look to. Because as he says here, right in verse 22, he tells us, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. So Jesus has never sinned. He has never victimized anybody. Though we could claim at some level, we receive our reward for what we've done. You know, you reap what you sow. We end up with some kind of victimization because we've done it to other people. And I'm not saying to blame you because you received, you've been victimized. That's not what I'm saying. No, don't, don't hear that. What I am saying, though, is that Jesus never victimized anybody, ever. And yet he received the horrible treatment of crucifixion, rejection, and death that he received. That's not to minimize what you've gone through, but it's to point you to one who knows exactly what you're suffering and to point you in a way forward. Because Jesus, though he was innocent, he didn't live in victimhood. Though he was the greatest victim, he didn't stay in the victimhood. He didn't live out these things. In fact, what we see is he was endorsed by God to, to actually, live, to, to, in the way that he lived it out. See, Jesus goes on to say, didn't revile when he was reviled. He didn't punch back. He didn't get angry. He didn't do anything. Peter describes this here in beginning of verse 23. It says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the judge who judges justly. In fact, this is the critical point that he's getting at, that guys, Jesus had every right to be a victim, but he wasn't. He had every right to be a victim. Why? Because, well, first of all, he bore our sins. Jesus had every right to be absolute in his thinking. He himself bore our sins, verse 24 says, in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by whose wounds you've been healed, he says. But the point is, he bore our sins. Now, get this for a second. In a real way, my sin put Jesus on the cross. Your sin put Jesus on the cross because he was bearing our sin, our victimization of each other he put on the cross. Our victimization of God he he took on the cross. And so he bore our sins, our victimizations of other people and of God. And and this is crazy. So Jesus literally could have said, all of you have done this to me. All of you have victimized me. It's all of you. He could have used that absolute language. Because if, if there's anything Mel Gibson got right, and I know he has his trouble, but when he was making the passion of Christ, what's interesting is he's the guy in the scene who's actually literally hammering the nails into the hands of Jesus. And they asked him, why did you do it? Why did you want to be the guy who was in that scene doing that part? He says, and he said this, he said, because this is my hammer. 
In other words, he was saying, this, I'm the one who did it in the first place. He was admitting that it was his sin that put Christ there. And look, Jesus has the right then to say it was all of our sin that put him there. Second, he has the right then to, to say, I, I can't, I'm going to have vengeance on all of you. I'm not going to give this up. I'm going to keep bringing it back because you put me there and I did nothing wrong and you're, you can't do anything about it. And he could have sent us all to hell right there on the spot. He could have done that immediately. And, and he didn't have to lean into anything else. He had that right. But he didn't. He didn't live. He chose a, in victimhood. He chose a different path. And it's one God endorsed through the resurrection on Easter. See, Jesus rose as the victim over victimhood. He rose as the one who had destroyed it and dealt with it finally and completely and fully. And man, that is so exciting. We realize there is a way out and Jesus shows us that route out. Because here's the thing. If there is no resurrection, Jesus is just another victim like all of us. Think about it. He's just a guy who got crucified. It's the resurrection that gives it any meaning. It's the resurrection that changes anything. Paul puts it this way. He says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. There's no point to what we're doing. There's no point in what we're engaging in. But because of the resurrection, Jesus is the victor over this victimhood. He is the perfect victim, and yet he has found himself as the victor over victimhood. It's no wonder when Peter is telling the church who's being victimized, even though they're being good people, even though they don't deserve anything, he is telling them, look back down here in verse 21, he tells them, listen, you have been, for this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you may follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And what I love about this is that you have this reality that he, we have him as our example. See that? He's an example for us to live by because God endorsed him as the example. And when we realize this, and when we gather this understanding, man, then we need to look at what was Jesus doing on the cross? How did Jesus overcome this victimization? And when we look at that, we're going to see an amazing way forward. And so as I help you out here, as we look at Scripture, Jesus is going to lead us on, from his statements on the cross and how to deal with being a victim. And this is, this is exciting for me because I really believe as we follow these statements, as we look at what Jesus says from the cross, as we unflesh these things out over the next part of this series, we're going to begin to see a journey that we can take to move out of the victimhood and into victory. And so I want to encourage you guys to look at what Jesus did, to look at these things that he set up while he was on the cross. The first and foremost thing that Jesus does is Jesus forgave. Jesus forgave all those people on the cross. While he's sitting there, he's doing the unimaginable. This is like forgiving the person in the middle of their victimizing you, in the middle of them harming you, in the middle of them insulting you. You're thinking, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, and even saying, you know what, I forgive you for that. That's crazy, but this is what Jesus does. While being crucified, he says this, and we know this verse. We, we've heard it time and time again. And it says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is moral perfection, folks. And he tells us, hey, you don't want to be victimized. You, you want to see my example? Forgive. Forgive. Don't choose to ruminate. Don't choose to be angry. Don't choose to vengeance. Forgive. Now, that's easier said than done. We're going to go over some of the steps on how to forgive, how to pack up and get out. But hey, first and foremost, I, I need to encourage you. If there's someone in your life you've been harmed by, if there are things in your life <clears throat> that are constantly offending you, begin to forgive. And just simply say, God, I forgive them. God, I forgive them. I'm not telling you to forget. We'll get into all that. But just right now, begin by seeing that what Jesus did was incredible. He forgave them on the spot. And we need to be able to do that. Well, he goes beyond that. Jesus didn't just forgive. While he's on the cross, he actually stays responsible. Jesus stays in his responsibility for his life and for everything that he's doing. See, when people are in pain, I've met a lot of people who, during their pain, during their suffering, they lose track of their responsibility. They say things like, well, 
It's not my fault. You know, I don't need to. Or they have excuses for why they can't get certain things done. Oh, you know, if it hadn't been for this, I would be able to do something else. They look at their vict- how they've been victimized or the circumstances of their harm in their life, and then they excuse themselves. They make excuses, and they lose track of their responsibility to the point where some people don't take care of their children any longer. You know, they got divorced, and they just can't go back. They lost a spouse, and they just can't handle anybody. And so what happens is they, they avoid these people. Jesus didn't do this. In the middle of his suffering, he looks down at the disciple and his mom who are there near the cross. And this is what he tells them. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which is John, who actually is writing this recollection, he, whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. What he did is the firstborn son was what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to cover for his mom. While he's on the cross, he remembers his responsibility, and he does it. He takes it and he says, This is my responsibility. I need to make sure my mother is cared for. John, you're here. You care about me? Care about my mom. Cover her and keep her. This is powerful. Jesus stays responsible. What is it in your life right now that you are ditching out on out of an excuse because of some harm or some situation? What excuses are you using? Why don't we drop those right now? What do you need to pick up? Who do you need to re-engage? Is it your children? Is it, a, is it a relationship you need to heal because of the divorce, because of a loss, because of something like that? Is it your father? Is it your mother? What is it that as you've forgiven it? What is your next step in the responsibility of taking back your life? Another aspect in, in this though is that Jesus didn't reject something. So I met a lot of people in their suffering, in their hurt, in their harm, that honestly, we want to help them. We go up to them, we say, hey, we've got Care Portal. We got, um, you know, just these various things, James Projects. Or maybe we show up and we say, you need help. We've got Celebrate Recovery. Come on out and get your hangups and your habits and your hurts. Come and deal with these things. And, and they go, I don't need any help. I've got this. I've been living with it all my life. I can handle it still. I want to say, really? Because, you know, you've been living with it all your life. It looks like you need some help. And Jesus wasn't afraid to receive help. This actually is fascinating to me. That Jesus, even while he's being crucified, just doesn't receive help. He receives it from those who are victimizing him. This is how much he'd already forgiven them. It says after Jesus, after this, after all this crucifixion and stuff that has gone on, it says, knowing that all was now finished, he said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine was there, uh, stood there, and so they put it on a sponge full of the sour wine and hyssop branch, and they held it to his mouth. Interesting that Jesus drank from this sour wine. He received the help from these people, from those who were crucifying him. That's huge. That's don't reject help when the help comes. He, he, when he was suffering and he was beat up, somebody else carried his cross. And he didn't say, no, I got this. Jesus understood that he needed help in the middle of his victimization. He involved the community. He pulled people in. He allowed people to be around. Who are you holding at arm's distance because of your hurt, your harms, your habits, your hangups? Who are you holding at a distance because you got this and you're morally superior? Don't do those things in your victimhood. Guys, I know you're hurt. I know you're suffering. And I know you're frustrated. Or maybe this thing has just bothered you. Bring people in to get well. If somebody's offering help, whether it's Celebrate Recovery in a recovery group that we have at the church, or whether it's a small group that wants to lean in, or whether it's your family members, receive the help. Don't do it alone. Jesus moves out of the victimhood by another thing. He he keeps his purpose. Jesus doesn't lose track of what God made him to do and brought him to do. In fact, this is beautiful because when we begin to look at Jesus we see someone who kept his purpose. And that is so critical. In fact, Viktor Frankl, a man who, had, who was a psychologist who went through the Nazi concentration camps, came out and said, there's one thing that kept everyone alive. Those people who survived had one thing, and that was they kept a purpose for their life. In that keeping of that purpose, in that ke- making their suffering worth something and valuable, that there was something beyond, some kind of battle, some kind of fight, something that they could do. When that happened, Viktor Frankl said, they survived. If you have lost your purpose in the midst of all of your harm and being victimized, you are one step short of just losing it all. Don't do it. Find what God is doing. Seek out that purpose. For Jesus, the suffering actually was his purpose. It's, it's, it's amazing. 
as he's dying, at the end with some of his final breath, it says when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, what is this? It is finished. It's the word testelestai. And what testelestai says, to telestai says is that it is paid off. Why would he yell an accounting word? It's like, hey, he was really, really upset about how his taxes were going to go, right? No, that's, that's not what was going on. He's not on the cross going, my taxes are paid in full. I dealt with my debt. No, he's saying, I paid off your debt. He paid off my debt. He paid off our debt. It's finished. Your debt is done. My debt is finished. And in that, he kept his purpose. Why was he on the cross? Remember what it said? It was, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. As Peter had already told us, that it was that beautiful reality of the fact that he died for our sins. By his wounds, he says, you were healed. That is exactly what we've received, is this forgiveness of sins because he didn't lose his track. He didn't lose his purpose. He didn't sin against God, get all ticked off and angry. In fact, when you read that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In fact, what he wasn't doing there was was saying, God, get lost. I can't stand you. He was quoting a psalm and that psalm was declaring something, a psalm that that they would have known starts off with feeling like God's far from them, feeling like God has forsaken them, but in the end is saying, even though it looks like I'm being crucified and I'm a victim, which is what the psalm is about. He says, I will trust you, God. It was a declaration of trust in God through his greatest victimization. And that is the last thing. While Jesus kept focused on his purpose to save me and you at the cross, he never lost track of his trust in God, and neither should we. If you're going to do anything to get out of the victimhood, we must begin with trusting God. Yes, we can forgive. Yes, we can keep our purpose. Yes, we can get engaged. But unless we trust God, we're not going to trust him to take the vengeance for us. We're not going to trust him that the suffering has a purpose. The bottom line is when we trust God, the trust of God means that we trust God as our best intention, His best intentions in the worst situations. He has His best intentions for us in the worst situations we go through. When we trust God, we're saying, God, I don't get why you've allowed this in my life, but I'm gonna believe that you have a reason for it. I don't get why I'm a victim in this scenario, but I don't believe you're out to harm me. I believe you're out to strengthen me. It's a lot like that child who walks into my room, into my, into my kitchen, like I said, and says, What? I have to eat this and it's broccoli and good stuff for them. They don't get that it's good for them yet. And they may want to complain. But as a father, it's my job to say, sometimes I got to serve you something that you don't like. Sometimes I got to put you in a scenario that's going to grow you and strengthen you. Sometimes I got to put you through things so that you'll lean into me. And look, I'm not saying that God intends these things to happen to you. But what I am saying is that God will be there with you in them. And that you can trust that he's drawn near to you. You can trust that he's always there for you. You can trust that he, while he knew they would happen, he already knew how he would respond. Because he was going to be the greatest victim. Jesus in the flesh was going to be the greatest victim. And so when he came to that point, yes, he shouted out that psalm, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. He said, I trust you, Father. It's no wonder when he died, he said these words. Jesus called out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. To tell us, die, into your hands I commit my spirit. I'm going to keep my purpose and trust you, God. And so what we have here is, is this opportunity that God is the one we trust. Jesus kept his trust in God. Because the bottom line is that when we trust God, he turns our hearts towards him, away from the victimization, away from this victimhood, away from this victim mentality. And we're able then to walk with him and trust him because he was the greatest victim. And in his victimization, he showed us a way through forgiveness. He showed us a way through these various things so that we can stay responsible, so that we cannot lose our purpose, so that we can trust God. And I get it. Some of you right now are going like, I'm really wrestling with this, Greg. You're trying to tell me God's the greatest victim? And right now you're thinking, do you know what God has brought in my life? Do you know what God allowed to happen to me? Do you know what God did to me? And right there I want to point out something. You just said it's not your fault. 
And I'm not saying you're, the victimization is your fault. But what you're saying is it's God's fault, not the person who harmed you. Oftentimes, we will lay blame on God where God doesn't deserve the blame. We will take the moral high road thinking God shouldn't have ever done X, Y, or Z on our behalf and these things. And I get that. That's a natural reaction. But notice, anytime we begin to do that to God, we're playing the victim. And yet, that's not what I see in Scripture. And hold on with me because I may be offending you right now and, and making you feel like, oh, you don't love me and I've really been victimized. Hold on. Here's the thing I'm trying to remind you. God understands what you're going through because he is the greatest victim. You see, you've ever heard of the thing called an effigy? You'll, you'll see this. When people, political people are so angry, they'll burn someone in effigy. They make a, a fake version, an image of them, and they light them on fire or they punch them or do things like this. An effigy is another word for an image. You are God's effigy. You are God's image. Every human is God's image. And when somebody harmed you, when they victimized you, and you became a victim, they did it to God because you are his effigy. When they do it to you, it's as if they are doing it to God. Every insult, every harm, everything that has ever been done to a human being on earth has been done to God in effigy, to his image. In other words, what they do to you is what they wish they could do to God. And vice versa, when I act as God's image, when I represent him and I harm somebody, I misrepresent him. I misrepresent him as a liar, as, a, as an angry person, as a lust person. And all of us have lied. All of us have lusted. All of us have objectified human beings. All of us have envied things and, and been jealous of people and thought horrible thoughts about them. All of us have, have made human beings out to be worse than they are. All of us have cheated and all of us have stolen from other people, harming them. All of us have been the victimizers to those who are made in God's image, his effigies. And we misrepresent God as a liar, as a thief, as an adulterer, as an objectifier. We, we've turned him into all these things which he is not. And this is why I say God is the greatest victim. The cross is just simply a symbol of Christ's, uh, of God's ultimate victimization. It's what we do if God showed up on earth. We kill him. It's why he was willing in his victimization, in his victimhood, to actually save us from ours. You see, if we continue to move on in a way thinking we got it ourselves, we'll deal with all this ourselves, you know, I'm a good person anyway, I, I, you know, I may have been victimized and all these things, and you don't want to receive God's help today. I, I just need to let you know, you will stand before God who you have victimized and you'll have to pay for that. And yeah, you'll end up in the judgment. And, and what happens in the judgment is some of us will go to hell, some of us will go to heaven, but everybody deserves hell. The weird thing is everybody in hell will be angry at the God who put them there, thinking that he has victimized them, putting them there. They don't deserve hell. And yet everyone in heaven will understand one thing. They did deserve hell. And the only person in heaven that ever suffered hell is named Jesus, and he is the one who didn't deserve it. And what's crazy about this is that God doesn't shut the door in your face, sending you to hell. He says, no, if you're a victim, come identify with me, the ultimate victim. Come in. I understand you. I love you. Come to me. My son has borne your sins on the cross. You don't have to go to hell. I'm opening the door to you. Come receive my help. Come receive my forgiveness. Come receive my grace. Come receive a new purpose in life. Come receive responsibility back. Come have it. I give it to you. It is a gift, and you don't have to reject it. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, so we would have a new start, so we don't have to live in the victimhood, but move into victory. And when we walk into the victoryhood, in a sense, when we walk into heaven, in the presence of God, we receive back all these things, and we don't have to live stuck, stuck as victims, but freed, having been forgiven to forgive having been given a purpose to share a purpose, having been given responsibility to give responsibility and use it appropriately. Guys, this is the beauty of what God offers you through a gift. If you will simply trust that Jesus Christ bore your sins, your victimizing of God on himself so you could be forgiven and not go to hell. If you can receive his help and his promise and walk after him, you will follow him into heaven. into heaven where God brings the victims, brings the pierced, brings the oppressed to himself through his son, 
the pierced and oppressed one to be forgiven and live with him forever. This is what I offer you today, and I want to give you that chance to receive it. You can receive it right now. You simply tell God, God, I trust you, and I'm willing to follow you if this is the gift you're giving me. I want to be forgiven of my victimization of you and others. I want to be forgiven and given a purpose for this life. I want to know what it is again. I want to get up and be responsible rightly to people around me. God, please give me that today. Come into my life and lead me forward. If that's what you want right now, we want you to receive it at this moment. Would you bow your head with me? Wherever you are, just bow your head with me right there as you're watching this. And just say this, go, God in heaven, I believe that Jesus Christ bore all of my sin and all the victimization I've done to others and and to you on the cross. I want to come to the great victim as one who also has been victimized. And I want to ask that you would now help me live I trust that you've taken that away from me. I trust that you've forgiven me. Would you please come into my life and give me that purpose and the energy to take it back and be responsible? I want to follow you faithfully all the way to heaven. I receive your gift. I trust you now. Would you lead me, please? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, if you did that, we're... We're, we're taking what we do every year, a little survey. And our survey is really about everybody watching. And we would ask that everybody here would then get your phone out right now and get prepared because we have a number. And it, it's a little survey that works like this. We call it the A, B, C, and D. And so these are the words that we're asking you. If you've been watching this and you are, you, you're watching, we want to hear from you. Just let us know. And you use this number, 951-382-5111. Three, eight, two, five, one, 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 bing. Right? Okay, so we've got that in our heads. And here's what you're going to text. It's a keyword. You can text already. If you are already a Christian and you've been walking with Jesus and you are faithfully trusting and walking with him, awesome. Let us know that you're watching. Just text already. And we just want to hear from you. And boom, you can let us know. That, and that's one way. Maybe you just made that decision about Jesus right now. You said, yes, I want to be forgiven. And you prayed that with me. Then text the word begin. We would love to get you information. We would like to get you a Bible. We would love to help you begin this journey with Christ of following him and learning more about how Christ moves us out and gives us strength in life. We'd love to continue to help you there. Maybe you're not quite ready yet, but you got questions and you're not sure awesome. We believe questions are excellent. We think that you need to pursue truth. And so we have something called Starting Point. It's an awesome opportunity for you to connect in. And maybe you've got questions you would just like to ask. You're curious. So if you're curious, text curious to us. We would love to help you begin to move forward and answer some of those questions in hopes that you do see that what Jesus offers is a truth and something you can receive. And maybe you're just Here you're watching because you're all gathered as a family at Easter and this is what you do and you don't really want it. Just let us know. Text, I don't want it. Don't. And we know that um, we'll receive that. And so just don't without the apostrophe, but you can do that and we will connect with you. Not. We'll just let you go. We're just glad you watched. We're so happy that you were with us. And really, it's just our opportunity to see kind of where everybody at Olive Branch and who's been watching with us are at. So again, already begin curious or don't. We're just glad you guys are with us. Please let us know where you're at. And we want to ask that God would bless you this Easter. Thank you, thank you, thank you for watching. And we are just excited because he is risen. Amen, he is risen indeed. God bless you guys. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him
rooms of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and i will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on jesus face let's sing those words again he shall return in robes of Well, hey, everybody, thank you for joining us on this Easter. We hope that you have an awesome time with your family, enjoying some food, enjoying some celebrations because Jesus Christ is indeed risen. And hey, that's one of these greatest times of the years. I don't know what you're up to, but I hope it is an amazing one. We would love to see you guys come on back either online or in person. Next week, we're going to be back at our campus and it'll be that um, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock services. And we will have a great opportunity to just hear more about how to move out of the victim We'll actually be identifying really clearly whether we're in that world or not and diving into some of those details in an effort to help untangle our hearts from this victim culture. Hey, we were just glad you were joining with us and we pray that God has met you and blessed you today and may you go with the power of the resurrection in you and around you for the sake of this Easter and your life. God bless you. We will see you guys next week.
so glad you didn't ask us if we prefer mom or dad better. Yeah. Because <laughs> then I would have been put on. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. I thought that's what you asked. That's, that's, that's what I heard you. That's what I heard you. Ask. In certain areas, who's, mom is easier. In certain mom areas, dad. dad is what easier. areas am I easier in? Um, I would say you're easier when it comes to to schedules and food, and probably uh, <laughs> movies. <laughs> and dad is easier when it comes to more fun things. I think. And, I don't know. You guys are easier in different things. She's saying that dad is more fun. That's okay. Yes, dad is a little bit Jean more fun. Jean Brown told me when you guys were babies that dads are always more fun. Mm. Okay, but you know what? Your dad is still a kid <laughs> himself. Yeah, but dad is a ham, okay? Right. You married a ham. You know, your dad, <laughs> your, dad has, your dad has four kids. Your mom has five. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's got six. six. No. Yeah, there you go. So, all right. Well, thank you guys. Love you guys.